and it's my great pleasure and my privilege to introduce to you Jambawa Marawili, participating artist in APT5, and also Will Stubbs, sitting on the other side. Will <coughs> is the art coordinator of Buku, Buku Lange, <laughs> Molka, and, and he's also going to be in conversation <coughs> with Jambawa. Uh, I'm going to pass now to, to Jambawa and to Will. Thank you. I don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, um, it is really important that I'm here with this gallery, um, a modern heart, which is really important to me that I came and disobey on this art and bringing all my significant arts into this building so people will know where, um, where, where uh, Yolngo turn, uh, Yolngo is on this, uh, his gallery is on this building too. So a few of Yolngo artists here too. Um, so it's really important to, to share the knowledge from the arts. We know um, some people think that these arts are not coming from the land, but the songs, the names, and the color of those um, arts, red color, yellow color, and also black color and white color. They all come from the land. So when our ancestors started before, they were using all those patterns, I mean those colors, and you know, it, were, it was used, we were using it in our own um, body, where all the kids, where the young kids are to disobey to those um, man ceremonies like we did last, um, to one week ago, lots of ch young people came into a um, um, ceremony, which is you know one of the old men who wanted to retire from those um, ceremonies and songs, and it, he is re really retiring. So most of the thing that we, I was running and looking after the young people. So, as you see those patterns and the color, it's almost coming from the land. To make, to make the jobs really look good, to, to complete the jobs, we always use brush and air price to complete the jobs, to make the neat job, and it is this what's been happened before. Uh, people used to use air price from my own air price. So one day, I was I was here in Sydney. I'm in, I'm in Brisbane. I went to other um, uh, other meetings, which is um, uh, Texas. I was uh, I was with all the Texas, and then uh, we were. Uh, they were asking us how to pay um, um, to pay the tax. Implementation of the GST. GST, yes, yeah. exactly. Australian Taxation Office. <laughs> exactly. And I was in that meeting and, and I, you know, everybody was sitting around and I was, <laughs> I stood up and said, look, how come you're going to buy, uh, how come you're going to charge me to, to, uh, 
to get all those red rocks and yellow rocks and, and black. And even from our own air price, how come you, how come you um, judging, judging us to, onto CST? Uh, and then, um, <laughs> I couldn't believe it because then, um, all those um, colors and, and the patterns and uh, red colors are all coming from the land. So um, we know where to go and get those colors. Back there in Anam land, we know where to uh, make a brush from our own air price. So you know, it was really uh, important to me. I still remember that. That was last, last, two, uh, last year. I was in this um, Brisbane meeting here. Yes, it's coming to um, um, to a states that um, uh, governments are asking for CST, but in um, most of us from Arnhem Land, we do know uh, we know where the where we can get a brushes and uh, where we can get all those colors. We're gonna have only a little bit of money just to buy a clue. And um, some brush, but we know we can do it. We can make our own brushes too. Even we can make our own clue from um, uh, from a bush clue. So um, yes, um, I was on the first section, which is I was explaining about my arts. Some of the arts that we I've been uh, learned from my father. And from other families, we started, that was my first arts from there. When you can see the big arts there. No, that's the one. So this painting was made in uh, 1997, which is the year after Jamboa was the winner of the Telstra 1996 Best Bark Painting Prize. And as far as this exhibition goes, which is a retrospective exhibition which includes five works from recently acquired works from the Queensland Art Gallery collection at the other end, created this year. Um, we have a work, third one down the line, is from the National Gallery of Australia's permanent collection that featured in the uh, exhibition Boyac, which was a landmark exhibition for North East Arnhem Land Art held in Sydney in 2003. The Art Gallery of New South Wales has the keynote painting from the exhibition Source of Fire, which was Jumbo Marawali's uh, solo exhibition again in Sydney in 2005. Um, this bark painting from 97 comes from the collection of the Art Gallery of South Australia. And my role in all this has been to pack these things up and send them off to the various museums and I've been there for a while. We um, realised the other day that when I met Jumboa he was my age now and uh, he seemed like a very old man at that time and I thought I was a young man and the first thing that he did to me when uh, I was learning, I drove to his homeland which is three hours drive, if you can drive during the dry season, along a very rough road, what some of you might not recognise as a road. And at the end of it, you come to Blue Mud Bay, which is a community at, in the town of Yilpra, where there's a hundred people who rely on Jumboa for their spiritual, physical, moral well-being. And from there, he said, hop in the truck, and we drove for another hour along through no road whatsoever over sand dunes and through country that it's pretty hard to make you see if you haven't been to Arnhem Land. Um, and we came to what is sometimes described as rainforest, but to Queenslanders wouldn't be recognisable as such. It's not the rainforest you get in Cairns. It's a conspiracy amongst a number of species of plants to grow spikes 
and sometimes called a monsoonal scrub thicket. So leaving the car at that point, I then followed Jumbura into that monsoonal scrub thicket for probably 20 minutes until we came to the tree that he wanted to cut to um, make some of his sculpture, which isn't represented in this exhibition. So we cut it down and then we carried it back in about five trips uh, after it was cut into pieces. I still have a scar from that trip, which was 1995, on my shoulder from eagerly carrying one of these things and trying to impress Jumboa. And we got to the truck and we loaded up the truck. And then he said, now, how do you feel? And I said, I'm fine, I'm, I'm great. He said, no, how do you feel? I said, well, I'm bloody hot. You know. On Wednesday when we came here, it was a cool change for us because um, we're in the build-up up there. So people complaining about the weather in Brisbane need to spend more time in the top end in October and November. He said, what else? He said, well, I'm scratched. I'm covered in cuts and grazes. And he said, yeah. He said, what else? I said, I'm dying of thirst. Like, I really need to have a drink. He said, yeah, what else? I said, I'm exhausted. I'm just totally buggered. He said, that's right. He said, and next time I come into your art centre and I bring you a carving, you remember that, how you feel right now. This is the physical reality of the artist's life that is so much a part of the land that it's actually made out of the land. But it has to be extracted by the, from the land. And the other thing that Jumbo told me at another time, I shouldn't be talking so much because he's much more interesting, but um, he explained to me that the land is complete. The land has everything that it needs. The only thing that it couldn't do was express itself. So it grew a tongue. And that is the Yongo people. Jumbo said, I am that tongue. The land grew. And the only reason is that I exist is to express the land. And this is what you're standing in front of. This is the land. I'll shut up. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll just shut up for I, a bit. I follow that. <coughs> yeah, um, yes. Um, I couldn't believe it when my um, elder or my father said, we have a land here. And, and when I became uh, about 16, 14, and we have a land here. And the name is called Banyala. And is it? How do we, how do we look after that place? My father said, "Look, you're not gonna, um, you're not gonna look after it, but you can describe the patterns and the design from the country, which is that was our ancestors gave us the story in that place." So when I wanted to claim my own country, this, this is, I am claiming all those countries that I belong, where my father and grandfather gave us. So the water holes, the name and the design and the shape of these patterns were given to us. Uh, given to my grandfather, and then my grandfather gave it to my father. Father taught me how to paint this. So, um, some of the paint patterns in East Arnhem, I cannot uh, go and use my mother's painting or patterns or designs, or to my grandfather, uh, my uncles, unless I have a permit to go on. Um, paint all those patterns. So we have a rules, the certain rules that we're not, we're not uh, um, getting from other other clans or from our other uh, families. I have to have a permit first to use those patterns. Like my grandfather's in mother's sides, I knew, I do know how to paint my. Uh, my um, my 
grandfather side, I do wanted to paint because I know how to paint those patterns and design. And well as I know the stories. So one of them the first little thing that I really when I really became an artist, well you you know that very well my friend, I decided to uh, make a pole. And that pole was uh, the name called Dakanjali. And in, um, when my grandfather passed away in those early 30s, 30, 35 years, they used pole to put my grandfather's bones into, into this, uh, like this pole. So when I grew up in 1930, uh, 1952, I went across from another uh, mission, so we said number one, I went to Blumat Bay and I saw those uh, image of those poles were still standing up, but all cracked and the bone was still there. So today, uh, we do you wanted to use pole and put it, uh, use everybody, uh, every clans are using now with their own uh, way of calling those pole. Like this pole, we call it Dakanjali. And that Dakanjali uh, hits a story too. Not only, uh, not only names, but if you can see what I meant to, The man who was hunting called, yes, you can see up there. The man, the two hunters went into, yeah, they went to look for, um, to hunt around for Jugong. And one of the, one of the um, uh, spear or pole they were using as a harpoon. And that harpoon, he, they both threw the, uh, when they got the jigong, and the harpoon turned into a monster called Dakanjali. So today, I believe, and I have my tribes and my clans, we believe Dakanjali is in the sea. And that is our story. So, so all of the Australian people here who've been well educated, in Australian history would be aware, of course, of the great tsunami that hit Australia. People are nodding, but they're lying because there is no, apparently no record of that, except there is in our history books amongst our intellectuals. Jumboy's side of the family is the record of the tsunami that hit Blue Mud Bay because he just referred you to this story of these two men. He spoke to you in English instead of singing it or dancing it, but here it is painted. And they went into the sacred area pursuing the dugong, ignoring the taboo on the special rock within the water there, and encroached, encroached too close to that rock. And when their harpoon either struck that rock, created the fire that's in all of these patterns is fire within salt water, specific to the Marapa clan of the Iritja Moiety of Northeast Arnhem Land and belonging only to Jumbo's clan. That fire in the salt water caused the water to boil and the water spread inland tens of kilometers and caused huge death and was the origin of the mortuary ceremony for Yongo people. And it's not just referred to by this clan, but by two other related Iritja clans who have the adjacent country. And I've worked with Jumbo since those early days when I was a young man. And my job is to write stories down that I hear and to, I've been writing and the ancestral tide swept in over the country and blah, 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 you know, without really thinking about it until the Boxing Day tsunami and I saw it with my own eyes as we secular people have to, to believe things. And I 
understood what this design, which doesn't just relate to land, uh, sorry, it doesn't just relate to sea, but because of the spread of that word, phrase, ancestral tide I've been writing down, not understanding, it's a bloody tsunami. It's a real thing and it really killed people in Jumbo's family and it, when he talks about handing a story from grandfather to father, that's a younger way of expressing in English a time period that not many Australians can summon up. And we don't know, I don't know, and I'm not particularly interested because only a linear Western brain would worry about it, whether this tsunami happened before the pyramids or after the pyramids. But there is no Western recognition of this event. There's no geological record or investigation or inquiry or confirmation. From the ordinary ethnocentric point of view, this didn't happen. But luckily, uh, the punitive expedition discussed in federal cabinet in the 1930s by the Lyons government to wipe out Jambuaya's family didn't actually take place because right-minded non-Aboriginal people were starting to take a civilised view of their own role in the world and that's part of the history of this art and part of the history that of Australia which includes as well as that a tsunami I'm happy to say or not happy for those people who experience it but the strength of that narrative or story or history to carry on through this design to 2006 to the Gallery of Modern Art is something that I respect a lot and invite other people to think about. And takes me to another role of Jumbo, just not just as artist, but as the uh, initiator of the uh, Salt Water Project and uh, the associated uh, claim to the court which has so far been unsuccessful and which is on its way to the High Court which will be, would be reported in uh, press as uh, you know, Aboriginal land grab is really a honest statement of the truth of the law that he is subject to as an Australian citizen which is that the reason why Yilpra where he lives is inherently connected to the sea and they share the same pattern is because the cycle of water from fresh water through to tidal water to the immediate coastal salt water pattern to the undifferentiated ocean to the vapour that rises from the ocean and is taken up by the feminine uh, thunderhead sitting on the horizon and then carried across to the hinterland to rain to give birth again is a metaphor for the journey of the spirit of Jambua and all of his people and the connection between the hinterland and the ocean that's inherent in that view of the world, a cyclical view of the world that connects the land which is borne out by the event of the tsunami is something that he is asking the dominant culture to acknowledge. That is the basis of the sea claim contrary to what you may have reported at some other point and the vehicle that he uses to express that is in an exhibition like this and as he said in the program of the Sydney Biennale I'm tired of going to exhibitions where people look at pretty pictures and see just he said it better than this I can't remember exactly what he said but he these are beautiful I mean that's a matter of opinion and you can form an opinion about that you might want to have an opinion about whether it's art or is it contemporary art or is it traditional art or blah, 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 blah. But this is working on a lot of different levels, including in the gritty political legal reality of whether or not the Western culture or the dominant culture is prepared to let this story live to show it the respect that you know, many believe it's owed. Anyway, that's all a bit heavy, but that's partly why you're here, I suppose, hopefully, to get beyond the pretty pictures. Malingo. <laughs>